Um, first of all, I may I introduce the first two speakers for the first talk. Um, Professor Ian Forbes is no stranger to us all, uh, having uh, been awarded the IANHR Lifetime Leadership Award just two years ago, a uh, picture of which you can find in the, in the, in the booklet. Um, he's General Manager of Aged Care Division of Argyle uh, Hotels, and he's also Director of Forbes Associate um, International. Uh, he has been a health planner for 40 years, uh, a very experienced health planner. And together with him, um, Mary Potter Forbes uh, has many talents. Uh, she is, I believe, with a uh, nursing background as well as a legal background. Uh, she uh, uh, has had uh, projects uh, done in Asia, uh, including Hong Kong and Malaysia. So without further ado, uh, may I invite uh, the two of them uh, to come up uh, to deliver the talk entitled The Environmental Behavior of Buildings. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I'm going to open and pass over to Mary uh, about halfway through. Um, what we're doing today is looking at case study design. Uh, the reason that Mary and I thought about this is because as researchers we come across an awful lot of material put up as valid research and it isn't valid research. Um, and we need to sort of remind people that there's, there's rigour that goes into social sciences um, uh, and case studies have been used for years as a hallmark in social science studies, um, used in early works to create groundbreaking research in theory building when many key variables, uh, there's a lot of key variables, and relationships are being explored. Used in situations where the variables outstrip the number of data points, we often find that there's a lot of things that have to be put together, and a case study research is a way of doing that. Uh, those who follow positivistic traditions using large databases criticise the case study approach as lacking validity. Um, architects have trouble with citing case study results to positivist medical people who hold valid only those which are double-blind trials. And I know that Peter Scher, who used to be a member of this academy before he passed away a couple of years ago, used to argue that we can't debate uh, the issues with people who hold double-blind trials as the only, or randomised control trials as the only method for, for validating scientific work. And that we always can do something about making sure that our social science research approaches are valid and controlled. Architects are guilty of not carrying out case study research properly and by using simple presentations of their work in case, as case study materials. This is not valid and is not being convincing. Uh, case studies need to have elements to make them vigorous, rigorous, should I say. There can be multi-method research studies that have some quantitative material, that's with statistical data, as well as qualitative material. Uh, but they must, they need to be studies which look at the context uh, rather than independence from the context. These lead to well, uh, well to architectural design studies in which the context is important. And I know that I'm preaching to the, to the converted because a lot of the studies that we've seen the last couple of days have been very valid and very strong research studies. Um, and we certainly should be encouraging more architects to look at the validity of their work when presenting it. Secondly, it's usual to collect uh, qualitative data such as questionnaires and analysis from participants and user groups. And that can be done fairly simply. In most instances, a rigorous case study has four key elements, internal validity, construct validity, external validity, and reliability. Now I'll go over each of those and then give you some examples. Internal validity called logistical validity by Yin, who's written a lot of stuff on case study materials. It deals with the causal relationship in the analysis phase between variables and results. The first thing to do is establish a clear research framework that demonstrates variable X leads to outcome Y and it's not spuriously caused by variable Z. And that's often what happens. We don't know that they haven't accounted for variable Z. Second, through pattern matching by comparison between empirically observed patterns or expected patterns from other research, which holds its validity. Thirdly, by adopting theory triangulation, this enables validation to be able to adopt multiple perspectives. You can see whether a thing is, is valid by its, its approach. Now, construct validity deals with investigation stage and as such deals with the extent to which studies investigate what is intended to be investigated. Did it do what it said it would do? 
And it's a concern about, uh, it, it's this concern about procedures that lead to accurate investigation. And the best way to do this is to establish a clear chain of procedures that allow another reader to follow this research. Also, again, using triangulation enables the researchers to look at the evidence uh, from different perspectives, so you can see. External validity normally is concerned with the generalizability or the ability to infer information about a population. Case studies don't have the statistical generalizability uh, that the big data sets do, but they do have an analytical generalizability, and that means you can infer matters from the observation to a particular theory or a particular aspect. Uh, Cross-case analysis is one way of achieving this, uh, and between four and 10 studies is a good way to provide a base for analytic generalizability. Reliability refers to the absence of random error, and this question is whether other following researchers can find the same conclusion if they follow the same procedures. The key words here are transparency and replicability. Transparency depends on careful measures to document the research procedures, and reliability is gained through building a case study database, including case notes. So that sounds complicated. Now, what I did was look at a, um, seven cases, uh, and it was to do with physical investigations from an earlier study, uh, which determined, determined whether the interventions were successful or not. Interventions covered garden designs, some internal petitions were changed, some changes to larger spaces by, for smaller ones. We knocked out a doorway to a bedroom in one facility, changing the location of the door to make a small lounge facility which gave residents a place to sit. So in other words, we changed the facility around. And to increase validity, we made a cross-case study between the seven of them and developed themes from the analysis now, some of the themes, uh, the three main themes, were that the significance of the type of physical investigation and the priority of various spaces had for staff and residents. We asked them what was the important space, not just, and I noticed that um, in Andrew and uh, Mia's study the other day, they had 14 categories. Uh, the question we asked was, which of these are important to you? Which are the spaces you would identify as important? not just the fact that they, they had 14 categories. Uh, and that was significant in the sense that a lot of things didn't have the importance that we thought they did in the various studies. The changes to the quality of life of residents in terms of the changes to behavior, did people um, change their behavior as a result of the investigation? And the effect of person-centered care training on staff attitudes. Now, person-centered care is a term presented by Tom Kitwood uh, several years ago, uh, in which he looked at uh, staff caring for patients, caring for residents, should I say, and the residents needed to be treated as individuals, as, as whole people, even though they were demented and couldn't con do all the things they were supposed to do. They all have dignity, they all have respect, and the staff need training in that process. It's not just something they adopt. Um, so from the first theme, findings were that people had to be trained as person-centered care, and those that were trained, we, we, as part of our study, we trained about uh, five train-the-trainers who went back into their facilities and trained other people, and they were enthusiastic to make physical changes because they were anxious to do the changes, uh, and where they hadn't had the training, uh, they were not changing their attitudes and they didn't, didn't pick up on the space changes. Uh, another thing from, was that where staff were not involved in the changes in making the change, and I know we've heard that a couple of times over the last few days, if the staff aren't involved, they aren't, they're ignorant and they don't, they don't engage with it. So the changes had little effect if they didn't get involved. It's held that the reason architects and designers don't have the necessary impact on facilities is they don't know what to change to make de uh, desperate um, the materials the other, despite the dearth of materials out there, they are definitely not able to uh, use information to make the changes they can. But I would suggest that the analysis shows there's not the lack of education amongst architects. There are numerous guides and good production manuals in circulation. It's that the architects must take the views of the clients into account, and clients and carers come at the problem from a technical basis related to cost and ease of management. So they don't want to change their views for psychosocial perspectives. 
So we found that we had a lot of trouble with the clients. And a lot of the architects that I talk to uh, have the same problem. They just are unable to get information through. So it isn't the fact that the architects don't know. Uh, it turns out that the staff are considered the most important element in gaining quality of care and quality of life. In every study we've done, the, the people are saying, are not interested in whether the, the facility, whether we have ensuite bathrooms or whether we don't have ensuite bathrooms. The things that they remember, certainly the demented patients, is the care they're getting from the staff. And we know that uh, the physical environment supports the staff in doing this, but it's not the physical facility itself which is making quality of care or quality of life better. The staff are critically important. The, um, the physical elements enable staff to allow residents to have self-control so they can go around, and this is very important, and certainly in achieving their activities of daily living. Uh, staff who demonstrate they care are the ones that make the difference. However, ensuring design for outdoor activities is essential. It came up all the time in the, in the questionnaires that the outside access is tremendously important, not only for pain relief, but for uh, distraction, for ability to go outside. And this has to be something they don't just look at, but they can actually engage with. Uh, physical spaces that organise to reduce stress, uh, improve the quality of life, and the ability to get into socialising in community spaces. This includes reducing the number of residents. Having large facilities is a problem. So having, breaking them down into smaller community groups where they can engage socially uh, is critically important. And so once again, staff training in person-centred care is essential to main a quality of life for residents. The second order effect, and this was quite interesting, is that residential care staff, unlike staff in hospitals, are not required to have very high levels of skill. So they're not very educated, and as a consequent, management ignore them. So getting the staff engaged with these changes we're doing is quite difficult because the management takes no notice of their staff. Uh, renovations are important and can be achieved through low costs. We found that looking at all the facilities we're dealing with, we can go in and do some changes at quite low cost to, um, to the facilities, uh, at renovations that is. But everybody, unfortunately, if you say what about renovations, they're all focused on the new build. So they're not really interested in doing that and there's a huge area there where uh, taking buildings and renovating them, particularly for aged care, where there's not a lot of technical requirements, you're not designing hospitals, you're not putting operating theatres and all these kinds of things in, make a huge amount of difference if you can do the renovations and you can do that. Mary, mental health. Um, well, I'll continue on now with an example of case studies that we did in um, mental health facilities in one of the states in New South Wales. Now, this was, um, it's again, seven sites um, involving funding from the, the state government and as well as from one of the, the areas where we did a specific set of interventions. Um, so the objectives really were, from the government perspective, was to identify the key environmental characteristics that makes acute care inpatient mental health units fit for purpose. Uh, that became an issue in any of the planning processes with which they were involved. And it was to investigate the relationship between these ac acute built environments and safety. Um, one of the, the frameworks we used for collecting the data and for interpreting was the patient safety framework, which holds that um, there's a whole layered effect towards safety um, in which at different levels of the organisation, at different times, there can be, things can go wrong and there can be defences that will protect against those, but if they all line up like a Swiss cheese, as it's known, you'll end up with a, an adverse event. And adverse events in mental health care units are, are suicide, self-harm, violence, and more extreme forms of violence. And we focused on the safety that could be um, created through uh, reducing the level of violence in facilities. So we had to draw on a wide variety of literatures, because as you know in this area, it's environmental psychology, um, there's the architecture literature, which is a, a, draws on its own wide range of literatures, um, anthropology, philosophy, huge 
uh, literature review was done to sort of encompass all the different strands of knowledge that we could draw on. Um, and social geography seems to be developing quite, quite good ways and tools for interpreting things. So we were structuring the material in terms of the physical, social and symbolic environments of care and how that affected the safety climate in the facility. And then we were going to evaluate the evidence-based changes in the built environment that we, that we introduced and see if that affected the incidence of violence and seclusion. What do I press? Down. Okay, and, and as well as that, there's a whole range of interest in this area coming from, again, a wide range of disciplines and the regulatory environment. So you're looking at the clinicians are looking at the idea that trust, as Ian emphasised in, in, in aged care, is the relationship with the staff that are generating safe, safe care, quality care, quality of life. Well, the Royal College of Physicians in the UK has made a policy announcement that it's the good relationships and interactions that builds the necessary trust for recovery within um, mental health units. And we also face now United Nations mandates on the freedom and rights of people who are um, incarcerated, sometimes against their will, in mental health units. Something that's been overlooked is the iatrogenic harm or the sanctuary trauma that can be caused by being in these units. Um, so it's one area of, of culpability, if you like, that, that governments and providers have not really, not really been held account um, on until recently. Okay, that, well that's the idea of trust in the mental health unit was one of the patient's artworks emphasised their, their desire for trust. Now the social geography of the therapeutic environment, the literature would divide down the physical environment, so you have the physiological responses to things, which there's been quite a lot of research done in this area, as you know, and I think there's a few of the most prominent researchers here in the room in these areas looking at the effects of environmental comfort, natural light, um, wayfinding, perceptual distortions, and the social environment, which is mostly coming out of the um, environmental psychology work. And it fits nicely into the salutary genesis ideas of coherence and manageability. And you've got issues of overcrowding, territoriality, the need for privacy and timing of social interactions, which has tended to be neglected entirely in mental health care, and the need for distractions, people who are otherwise living for 24 hours a day, sometimes for up to a couple of months in an acute care facility that may or may not have any diversionary activities or outdoor spaces. And, and something that's been emphasised more these days is spiritual needs. And then there's the symbolic environment. How comprehensible is the environment? What meanings do people attach to the environment? And that's as much an issue as to the staff and their ability to, to create trusting relationships with the patients or to learn to trust the patients and allow them to grow and recover. Um, it's whether you, you're creating a refuge in which you can be trusted or um, a jail. So to stick with our theme, rather than go into details of the, of the cases and the, the findings, I'll just go through what the methods were that we used across this array of these seven cases. Um, so we're very concerned about the external validity because it was initially funded by government it was, and they wanted to know what can they apply uh, generalizably when they go in to talk to clinicians, what can they wave and say, no, we know it, your personal opinion has no value here. So that was, if you like, the agenda underlying the start of all this research. Um, we used mis mixed method study design to so produce a sufficient triangulation of data. So as many methods as we could to build up a rich picture so that there would be a clearer understanding or a, a, a valid understanding of what was going on. Now the cases were selected um, by location, so in this, rather, this the largest state in Australia population wise. Um, we looked at two tertiary referral, one, one urban, one in a remote area, um, in two rural facilities, outer urban, inner urban. And the patient profile and service roles range from intensive care units, which were a, a new thing in Australia in the last 10 years, acute care, rehabilitation and adolescent units, and there's some overlap there because the adolescent unit cuts across a couple of those. And the procurement method, and that was, became glaringly a, a major issue, was the procurement method and the management decision making that was influencing the potential for harm at the, at the delivery of care. Um, so the, the traditional and the design and construct and PPPs, as we call them in Australia, public-private partnerships, 
and then the, what change management strategies were put in place, and that really was a timing issue. What was the change management for the new facilities, was that started within the strategic planning process even before a built option had been decided upon, or was it left to the very last minute as a merely technical commissioning exercise? As most of the architects here would know, if it was the latter, it was a very poorly received project. So these are the type of methods we used to try and ensure we had internal validity. So documents and artefacts. So all the planning and, and development process documents we could get our hands on, any post-occupancy evaluations, remedial works that were done. And one thing that came out which I didn't collect, which would be interesting, would be the, the repair works um, budget and what, what was being done in various units because that was, in one of the units, there was such a lot of um, regular repair to the fabric of the building that had to be done. That was a good indicator of, of how well the building was operating in terms of safety and the relationships with staff. Um, did site visits, so this is sort of an intuitive level, I suppose, walk through, talk throughs, we called them. We were looking to understand how staff were interacting. It was a very, it wasn't really an ethnomethodological study, but it was somewhat on that, of that in ilk. Our intention was to gain, uh, gather data that way within the time we had. Um, and key informant interviews, over 50 hours of talk time in the end, and three focus group groups at the facility which where an intervention was introduced. Um, then also we used photo elicitation of meaning using the repertory grid technique, which is something that um, comes out of psychology by Kelly, and it's used a lot in consumer research now to gain an understanding of the meanings that people attach to objects, places, and we're using for spaces. And I'll show you some examples in a minute. We also tried a quasi-experimental interrupted time series, um, but unfortunately, by the time we got through various bureaucratic processes and risk management evaluations, and eight months had passed, and within that time, a new unit had been opened, there were new policies, new staff, so there ended up being insufficient data points, and just there were too many changes in the environment so we got a trend analysis of the impact of the changes on incidents that occurred, violent incidents, but it was the stat statistician involved found it a little bit challenging to do much more with it. So that was one limitation which goes towards the value of qualitative methods in case study research. That you, it's, it's a dynamic environment, you can't collect the data as readily as you'd like. And a safety climate survey. Okay, uh, based on one, it's only 15 items, a one pager that was very easy for staff to fill out and gave a fairly clear indication of how they felt about the space. And as Ian was saying, it's the staff who, are, who control the environment, if you like, and the staff are the people, that, the patients in both aged both age care, particularly dementia, and mental health, they look to the staff as the people with whom, who are going to help them recover in a very personal way. Oh. Okay, oh. This is and I, just a quick view of how you go about with getting the semantics of the um, using the repertory grid technique where the, the first stage of it is you get three a triads of, of images, two of which will be alike and one won't. So in this case, if you can see them well enough, you'll see we've got ugly spaces, which are taken from facilities we looked at. So there's various spaces, entry places that are extremely poor, one's damaged, one's you fall down a narrow flight of stairs, and one's a pleasant space. So these images are shown to people, and you get them to explain what, what, which two are alike, and which two are not. And you get words coming out like empty versus welcoming, cold versus open, trapped versus warm. And you do that for all the spaces. We had 10 different spaces. And then there's, you can do a content analysis to get a, a vocabulary that's used, and also you can generate a, um, a to principal components analysis, so you can actually use a Likert scale. So you can introduce some quantitative component into it. Okay, um, in terms of the qualitative data, I've almost run out of time, so I'm gonna rush now. Um, the, the narrative analysis of all that talking that we did showed clear, quite clearly that the, the sense making was determined by professional identity and role. There were lots of conflicts in the planning process and in the, what was the result, and it was obviously because of, of what people's responsibilities were. Interestingly, the senior clinicians and junior clinicians would have quite different views. Okay, well, I just, I suppose the last thing, so I'm running out of time here, is the thematic analysis showed that the, there's conflicting conceptions of risk in these environments. 
between originally you look at therapeutic risk in any other context and you say that you're trying to mitigate a harm on the patient. In mental health care, it's the patient who's seen as the risk and everything has traditionally been done to, to contain, incarcerate, etc. Now, our new our approaches to psychiatric care now are not to do that, but to help people recover. And that's the final slide, which will show you if you're looking at the trajectory in a patient safety model of how the latent errors in the physical environment, social environment, symbolic environment can lead to active care management problems, which will lead to the adverse event, which will be um, acts of violence and seclusion. And in the instances of all the cases we looked at, the whole seven, the, the, the primary determinant of the latent error were decisions made by management during the planning process or afterwards. That's it. <laughs>